Stories. I am your host, Jay Blakesburg. Uh, it's been a few weeks. We took a little break uh, because of the Labor Day weekend holiday. And uh, I just want to throw out um, a lot of uh, prayers and love to all the folks in California and Washington and Oregon that are uh, struggling with all the fires and the smoke and um, the disaster that is happening there. Um, and uh, uh, hope that everybody's safe and, um, and doing the best that they can to get through this. Um, today, we've got an incredible guest. We've got uh, my dear friend, Lisa Law. Lisa's down in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, Lisa is this incredible person who um, was in the right place at the right time over and over and over again, beginning in the 1960s. And we'll get to that in a minute because first I got to just thank a variety of people. Um, of course, I want to thank fans.com and Pete Shapiro, our video director, Will Schwerd. And uh, we got Harrison manning the questions, which reminds me that if you would like to ask Lisa questions at the end of our program, uh, just put those in the comments section on Facebook, uh, on, on uh, uh, anywhere that you're watching this program that allows you to put in comments, you can put your questions in. Um, if you're not watching on Facebook, you can watch it on the fans.com uh, Facebook page. You can also watch it on the Jay Blakesburg Photography Facebook page. And so you can just add your questions in there. Uh, we are live with Lisa. I want to thank Pete Shapiro, of course, uh, and all the music fans and all the people that are into photography and like to sit around on a, on a Sunday and watch this program with me. I think they're fascinating. I love all these guests that have been agreeing to come on and talk to me about their experiences uh, as photographers. And, um, you know, when I, when I talked to Pete Shapiro about doing this on fans, he was like, well, you can also get people that aren't photographers and we'll call it stories with photos instead of photos with stories. And so we actually have a few things coming up like that. And I'll tell you about those later, but the next one of these that we're going to do is going to be on September 27th, which is a Sunday. I think it's two Sundays from now. And that's going to be with a guy named Clayton Call. Clayton's an old friend of mine. He lives in Berkeley, California. And Clayton started photographing um, rock bands in the mid-1970s. He started shooting Jazz Fest in 1990 and did that for about 25 years. He shot everybody from the Grateful Dead to Todd Rundgren to, to, to the Tubes and on and on and on. Just so many incredible people. Um, so that's Clayton Call, Photos with Stories on September 27th. Um, and... Uh, all right, so let's welcome Lisa Law. Hi, Lisa. Thank you so much for coming on my program, Photos with well, Stories. This is so exciting for me to be on your program. I can't believe it. This is fun. Great. Well, awesome. So uh, up on the screen here, we have her website, flashingonthe60s.com. And that's a nonprofit organization that she started and it encompasses sort of her whole world. Uh, Lisa made a documentary film called Flashing on the 60s. Uh, which you can buy on her website, flashingonthe60s.com. Um, I just watched it. It's an hour long. It's super informative. It's got interviews with Ram Das and Graham Nash and Peter Coyote and all Wavy Gravy. And all of those people are her dear friends, right? These are people that are super close to Lisa for decades and decades. I mean, she's been best friends with Wavy Gravy for almost 60 years now. Um, she has this book, Flashing on the 60s, which is her photo book. This book is essentially sold out, right? But she has about 25 copies left. And if you go to her flashingonthe60s.com website and send her an email, I believe she will give you a discounted price on this book if you tell her that you saw it here on Photos with Stories. I think that book is normally $75 and she will give you some sort of a discount. Um, so just reach out to her via email about buying that book. It's an incredible book. I love it. Um, one of my favorites. Here's another one of her books, which is Lisa Law, Interviews with Icons, and that's Wavy Gravy on the cover. So um, Lisa's been in, in the media for, for decades, right? And um, she was a hippie with a camera, and she really knew how to use it. She was a professional photographer. Um, she studied photography. She went to the College of Marin. Um, she was a trailblazer. Blazer. She took LSD for the first time in 1962. 
She did the blue liquid LSD in 1962. Think about that. LSD was still legal for four more years when she first did it for the first time. So uh, hopefully your grandchildren are not like freaking out that I'm telling everybody that you, you took LSD because certainly your children know that, you know, I know Pilar's watching and uh, she knows all about it. So anyway, so, 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 um, uh, so Lisa, you went to the college Marin, you're living in the Bay area and, um, and then you meet this guy that's up on the screen. This is Frank Werber. And I've got three photos of Frank Werber. This first one is a nice portrait you did of him. And then there's a couple of shots of him around these race cars. Tell me about who Frank Werber is and how he is important to your life and what he sort of opened up the doors for you to do and where that led uh, and led you. Well, he was, he owned the Trident restaurant in Sausalito. And I used to help him get his band members into the club so they'd play. And, and I said, well, I'm going to leave, Frank, and I, I'm going to go to New York and be a taxi driver. He says, what? I said, well, I'd make more money there. I'm not making it here. I'm cleaning houses, and I'm helping you for free. He goes, wait a minute. So a day later, he called me up. He says, I want to hire you as my personal assistant. So I was also part of his pit crew with his uh, race cars. And, uh, and I took care of his house, his Cadillac, his motorcycle, his yacht, and his cooking and his cleaning and everything. And he taught me how to do gourmet cooking. And his daughters watching, uh, Chala, Nicole Kachina, and his ex-wife, Diane. Awesome. So, so, but Frank was also really important. So first of all, the Trident, the Trident in, in Sausalito is a legendary venue. And if you, if you do a little search on online about the Trident, you can, there's a whole big cool article about how crazy the Trident was in the seventies. I don't know if Frank still owned it in the seventies, but it's a legendary place where David Crosby and the Grateful Dead and, and Neil Young and all these incredible musicians hung out at the Trident in the seventies. It was owned by the Kingston Trio and Frank Weber. And Frank managed the Kingston Trio. And uh, uh, so tell us about, you know, Frank's other business, which was managing rock bands. And, uh, and, and, and then Janice Joplin. What's that? Janis Joplin, Mystery Trends, Sons of Champlin, uh, We Five. Right. So I have a photo up here of Peter, Paul, and Mary. And so this is a show that he brought you to in Oakland. And this is where you met a guy named Tom Law, who later became your husband. Tell me about that transition to starting to go to shows and bringing your camera. Well, I was already shooting since I was six years old because my father was a cameraman. He did, he did 16 millimeter shooting and he gave me a little brownie. So I've been documenting my life since I was six. So I just took a camera wherever I went and I went to this concert and I shot it, went backstage and I saw this gorgeous man and I said to Eddie Sarkeesian, who was a booking agent, who's that? And he says, this is your husband. I said, I know, introduce me. And I ended up marrying him later. He was <laughs> right. But I found out he said that to all the women that looked at Tom Locke. 30 <laughs> years later, I found that out. <laughs> Funny. All right. So we have Peter, Paul, and Mary. And then here's the Kingston Trio. And I'm guessing that Frank asked you to do some sort of a publicity photo because this is a, a posed portrait of them next to this vintage automobile. No, um, this was cheating because uh, he, this was being shot for an album cover and I just happened to shoot right next to the photographer. So I got the same shot. Got and it. I love that shot. That's at Frank's house in, in Mill Valley. Got it. Yeah, it's a great picture. It totally looks like Mill Valley. And who are the We Five, which is this photo that I have up here now with this woman <laughs> and uh, uh, four guys, the guy with the sombrero. Who are, who are, who are the We Five? I don't know much about Well, them. that's John Stewart's brother way over there on the left. John Stewart of the Kingston Trio. He started this group. Got it. And okay. we were rehearsing at Frank's house. And then I would shoot them live at a concert. And they're the ones that wrote this song. Um, uh, what was that song? <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I don't know much about it. All right. Well, that's okay. So then you find I yourself. This morning you were on my mind. Uh, you were on my mind. I got troubles. Whoa, whoa. I got troubles. <laughs> that was a, a number one hit. How could I forget that? Folk song. So here you are at the at the Beatles in 1965. Is this? Oh, Frank Werber's uh, one of guys worked for him. Uh, got two backstage passes from the Trident uh, Productions that Frank ran, and we went. And he's there on the left with the blonde hair, 
he took me to the concert. We were right in front for the first concert. And you know, the kids were throwing jelly beans and screaming so loud you couldn't even hear what they were playing. They couldn't hear it either. Right. Yeah. Crazy. I'm sure this is, and this is before the candlestick show, of course, and this is the cow palace, correct? Yes. And at night there was another concert and the grateful dead went to see them at that concert. That yeah, that's, I've read that before. That was legendary. I love this shot of George Harrison here that I have up. And of course, now I think you were telling me this shot that was taken from the side of the stage who was sitting next to you with this. No, the one where the group, the whole group. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm looking at right now. Looking at that now. Uh, right behind me on one of those speaker boxes, those trunks that, with wheels on them, was sitting Joan Baez. Yeah, Joan Baez. So, you know, uh, Jim Marshall, another obviously famous photographer, was a friend of yours also. Um, he has pictures of Joan Baez backstage meeting the Stones and the Beatles. And the thing that was so interesting is that Joan in the United States was as big a star, if not bigger than these bands at this time. You know, like I've, there's a picture of, of, of her with the Stones at the Cow Palace. They didn't even sell this, the Cow Palace out. And she was selling out 20,000 person arenas playing solo acoustic at, in, in 62 and 63. So it's, you know, so Joan was meeting these people that were coming over like the Beatles and the Stones, but she was as big a star as her. But wasn't uh, she already playing with Bob Dylan at that point too? Uh, yes, she had already done Newport Folk and all that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, she was right there with Bob Dylan. Uh, John, John Sebastian is this next one here with the guy with the floppy hat. That's is that Cow Palace Two, the Love and Spoonful? Love and Spoonful, and, and, and then, then this backstage. Is, right, and uh, yeah, I've I've been right there in that hallway with that a gate there at concert. And some shared there too. Yeah, they were at that concert too. Um, and then we get to this place, and this is a contemporary photo of a, of, a, of a building called the Castle. So you moved to, um, uh, so you connected with Tom Law. Bring us up to from from Frank Werber meeting Tom Law in the Bay Area, leaving the Bay Area and going back down to L.A. and ending up at this place called the Castle and what the Castle was and why you were there and, and, and how that all happened. Well, after I saw Peter, Paul and Mary, um, two weeks later, Tom Law asked if he could come stay with me at Frank's house. And he stayed with me uh, for a few days and uh, we kind of fell in love. And when I went down to LA uh, to take care of my grandmother who had a cataract operation, uh, uh, I said, I'm here. And he called me and he said, so he took me over to the castle. He says, what do you think of this? And he says, look, I found Lisa, Lisa Bacellis here. And, and I said, boy, I like this castle. And he says, well, you want to come live here with me? And I said, well, if you uh, if I can be your old lady, I'll come there because I don't want to just be your cleaning lady. And he says, OK, you can be my old lady. So he kind of proposed to me like that. You could be my old lady. And I moved. He came up and got me from uh, San Francisco, drove me down and I started living in there. And all these people would show up. I mean, there's Tim Harden. I shot his first album cover uh, on the grounds um, in the garden down below with those jade plants. And um, Barry McGuire lived there and Severn Darden. And uh, then uh, we had Bob Dylan lived there and the uh, Velvet Underground lived there. And uh, th we had parties where uh, Owsley was there and uh, uh, there was, everybody was there. And, uh, and we were there for a year, just partying up, dancing, dancing to Rubber Soul in the in the big, huge ballroom. And so what is this, what's this, what's this, black, what's this black and white shot with this big crowd with the people, all their hands held in a circle. Tell me about that shot. That's uh, the, um, the um, Elysian Park love in on Easter in LA. That's one of the things we went to. I think uh, Barry, McGu Barry McGuire went to that too. And here's uh, this beautiful hippie girl that was there. Isn't she gorgeous? Love that shot. So then you get to, so then there's the typewriter shot. Whose typewriter is that? Okay, that's that's Bob Dylan's typewriter. So he stayed there just before he went to Europe on his big tour. And I think he stayed there a week or two. And I was his cook and his masseuse. And I was photographing him like crazy. And I'm lucky that I did photograph him a lot because that picture of him looking down in the solarium 
is a very uh, well loved picture of him. Yeah, I love this shot. I have it. I have it hanging on, hanging on my wall in my office. You gave me a copy of it. I love this. Yeah, but he was there with Albert Grossman, and Blonde, Blonde on Blonde just had happened, and uh, we went shopping to get him his polka dot shirt. And uh, well, there's the. Uh, I don't see what you're seeing, but uh, uh, the, I got the uh, right now. I'm showing the pictures of him with your husband Tom Law, where they're goofing around, and. Right, we, and then, here, and then this is the polka dot shirt that you're talking about. So you went shopping with Bob to get him his clothes, right? Right. And, and then, uh, then go down further with his hands. Yep. That one with his hands and the cigarette. Yep. So that right one, this one that became the the book cover for. Right. I've done a several book covers for Bob, and this is uh, an, a biography. And right. that they called me up for a different picture, and I said, "No, you don't want it. You want this picture." And they said, yeah, we want this picture. So yeah, it's just a, it's I've done a lot of photographs for Bob. Look at his fingernails. Like, I think, you know, just like, and it looks like his nails are long on his right hand and not his left. So maybe he's. Yeah, that's from playing guitar. And, right. and also, if you look in his glasses, you see the window behind him. It's a big, huge bay window in the castle. Yeah, I see. And behind it is the L.A., downtown L.A. Got it. And then this next shot is Albert Grossman, who, of course, was his manager. And uh, this is him with, I think, his tour manager. You were telling me the guy with the hat and the glasses. And then we get to the shot of Robbie yeah, Robertson. Victor, so the, ba so the band was hanging out. But that's Victor Mimutis. He was very important to Bob because he would, whenever Bob had to leave a concert, Victor went first. And Bob just was behind him, grabbed onto his, his jacket because Victor protected him. And he was his road manager for a long time. Right, right. We call that him being the blocker. He was blocking for yeah, Bob. He, was, he went every place with him. And Victor was a dear friend of ours, too. And right. he lived here in New Mexico a lot. So here's Robbie Robertson at the castle. Were the, were the band staying there as well or just Bob? No, just Bob was staying there, but the band was coming and going. So I got a lot of pictures of the band. And then Robbie was just sitting there in the living room. And, and, then, he, and then we and then we get to this shot of you and Bob Dylan and your husband Tom at a nightclub. Um, what what's the story with this photo here? Where's this? This is on Sunset's trip. This is the Whiskey a Go Go, and I believe Taj, who's watching, uh, opened for uh, Otis Redding. And somebody took this picture, and it's on on the Getty Images, and that's me and Bob and Tom and Patrick. And we'd all just come there from the castle to watch Otis Redding. Which is, and these shots here of Otis are from that show also? Yeah, so I'm sitting there and I have my camera as usual. Of course, I didn't shoot us sitting there, but I got up and I went crazy over Otis. And I jumped up and I started shooting and I was having trouble getting pictures of him because he was moving around so much. He was jumping all over the place, but a few of them I got uh, where he was in focus and I'm shooting available light, always with my uh, Nikon F at that point. And uh, those pictures are then used by Atlantic Records later for his promo shots. Love these shots. I mean, uh, God, what a, what a dynamic performer. And he an album cover. Yeah, amazing. So then uh, he went backstage with uh, Bob, and Bob said, I'll let you have one of my songs to put on your uh, album. And he did. And it, uh, that's a historic moment. Nice. Yeah, that was a wonderful event that we went with with Bob. So then we get to, we're back at the castle, and we've got <coughs> Lou Reed and, and Nico, uh, Velvet Underground, which looks like they're maybe sitting out on a deck on some cushions or something. Uh, what was Lou Reed like? So you're hanging out with Bob Dylan, and now all of a sudden Lou Reed's at the castle? So the um, same thing. Um he, he, they came, the Velvet Underground came to play at the trip and they all stayed at the castle and they booked rooms. And this is up on top of one of the uh, second floor. That's on top of the first floor on top where the second floor was. And that's actually where Dylan's floor was too. And uh, they would rehearse. And so I would go up there and photograph them rehearsing. And then they, they opened it to trip. That's a, all these pictures, by the way, of the uh, Velvet Underground are used in all their books and audios and movies and shows because I'm the only one who had them that, at that point in L.A. Nobody else knew except one person shot them in the 
solarium. But other than that, I'm the one who shot them. And, right, then and, it, you were, and you were saying like right now I have the group shot of them uh, at the trip live and you can see all the projections and the shadows from uh, Andy Warhol's projections. And you were saying that the other photographer that was there was using a flash on camera, which washed all that stuff out. And you show the one of Nico. Show the one of Nico above yeah, that it. That was this one right here, which is beautiful. Okay, so that's the uh, film. Uh, they were doing a, a, what do I call them? Screen tests. And, he, and Andy had done a bunch of screen tests with the velvet and he projected them on the rear of, of this concert. And, I, and that's what these pictures are famous is for, for, is for seeing the screen tests on the back. It's remarkable. I love this shot of Nico. I mean, like how, I mean, this photo here just embodies that beauty of her voice and the time. And I mean, I just, I, I love this shot of Nico. He was wonderful. I, mean, I just, I really enjoyed having them at the castle. And then back and here, for all of them. right back at the castle and she's reading some magazine called Rave. Um, all right. And so then after you leave the castle, your life takes this completely new turn and you end up living in Mexico. So, so this first photo here, I believe is in Mexico. Um, tell me how you end up deciding to leave the castle, leave this glamorous lifestyle that you and Tom Law are leading with like all these incredible celebrities and musicians and pop culture um, and decide to go to Mexico. So well, we were there at the castle for about a year and uh, we had both fallen in love with Yalapa, Mexico outside of Puerto Vallarta and you can only get there by boat. And uh, so we, Tom says, let's go live there forever. I've got a piece of land we can rent from Pablo and uh, we'll build a house, a little palapa and we'll live there forever. And I said, okay, let's go. I love it there. And I'd been there in 1961 when I sailed down uh, from San Francisco. I was going around the world on the Fairweather, the yacht Fairweather, the Gaffrey schooner. And I had stopped there for one night and, and I took three pictures were now, that are now on a mural in the front of Yalapa. And we were going to build on the mountain behind those palapas there. And uh, so I started shooting pictures of the town and the people and people making um, canoes out of Perota wood trunks and people washing their clothes in the river uh, with lean-tos from uh, the palapa leaves and branches. And uh, I accidentally drank some bad water and I got hepatitis B. So I was very, very ill, and uh, he was taking care of me, Thomas taking care of me. And then somebody came by and said, hey, have you heard about Maria Sabina giving mushrooms to um, the professor? He's on the cover of Life magazine. Uh, they're, they're, they have magic mushrooms down in, in Wautla de Jimenez. Let, and Tom goes, let's go. And I went, wait a minute. I, the house, the building house here, live here forever? And he said, no, nah, let's go. Take the mushrooms. <laughs> must have taken Indians. Yeah. And I'd already taken acid, so I knew what that was all about. And so had he. And so we go down to Wautla de Jimenez. I barely made it. I was so sick from hepatitis. It was all yellow. And that's where you met this, old, this older woman here who is, tell me the story behind this woman. Well, she was there. Somebody was taking a picture of her. And I said, well, can I be next? And she said, sure. And I took a much better picture of her. And uh, it became, she's just an old lady that was there. It, she became Mushroom Lady in this poster in the Haight-Ashbury when we got back. It became, Steve Samuels did the artwork for it. And we did this beautiful poster, which was very popular then. A lot of people bought that in the Haight-Ashbury. It's but like later, the shop and the poster mint probably all sold it. Later, uh, well, during that time, oh, Tom left. After uh, he took the mushrooms, he left and he went back to L.A. And I was there for a month recuperating from hepatitis and getting to know these old ladies in the market. And I would sell fruit. I would sit there and wear the same clothes they were wearing. I'd braid my hair like they had and I had ribbons in my hair and wheat peels. And these are all handmade wheat peels after they take the mushrooms. They make these psychedelic wheat peels. 
And I actually was in the marketplace with this woman, Maria Sabina, selling food. Well, I came back 10 years later with Sally Grossman and took that picture of her for the cover of her book, La Sabia de los Hongos, and the woman who knows the, the, the mushrooms. And she was very famous and there was a book done by her. And, but these other pictures uh, below are pictures I took when I was there in 1966 of the marketplace, the woman in the Weepeel, and, uh, and, and then there's that picture of you in the Weepeel, uh, uh, among the dog and the chicken. And then there's a picture of me in a Weepeel from Mexico rather than, uh, yeah, well, Mexico, we were in Mexico, but from a different town when uh, I was walking around and visiting with the, the Mazatecan Indians. And um, I did, a, in fact, I'm about to, to frame all those pictures and put them in a restaurant here of Mexico. It was such a wonderful time for me to, to be there during that time. In fact, they, cl they closed down Wautla because in 67, after we left, Every hippie in the world wanted to go there and take the mushrooms and they couldn't handle it. So they closed the road. So people couldn't come and take the mushrooms. So did Tom come back to Mexico and get you and bring you back to the hate at, in the end of 66? Uh, he almost died in the hospital of hepatitis with Victor Maimutis. They got it after me. And it, when they left, when they left Wautla and went back to LA, they became violently ill and went into the hospital. So I heard about it and I jumped in the bus and drove all the way up to LA to stay with Severn Darden and help care for uh, Tom. And at that point, my father had taken acid, my stepfather. And he'd hated me before because I smoked marijuana and took acid and he used to spit on me and he'd see me. Well, my mother and he broke up and he ended up living in Nicasio and these, all these hippies were renting his houses there in Nicasio and Barnett's place it was called. And they gave him acid and they had him smoke dope and he took me out to dinner. I flew up to have dinner with him at, in the Mill Valley and he says, it wasn't that I didn't love you. It was that I didn't know what love was until I took <laughs> acid. Nice. All right. So now you're up in the Bay Area and it's late 66, just before the human being in, in January of 67. And you take this photo of this woman in this Mexican dress, some hippies. Um, and I'm from Wautla. From where you? That's the out, outfit from Wautla. Right. So the hippies and the hate were already wearing these Mexican clothes. They had been there. They had been there and taken the mushrooms. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that during that time, there was the anti-Vietnam march which I documented mm -hmm. and uh, took all these pictures of the March, which are now in my book. And they're used in lots of books, educational books of uh, what was happening during the sixties. Right. This is the um, psychedelic shop uh, in the hate. And then there's, I started uh, with Victor Moscoso asked me to shoot a picture for a, a poster he was going to do for the matrix. And uh, we, I did this shot. I did so this is Janice Joplin and big brother and Victor Moscoso, of course, is one of the big five poster artists in the hate Ashbury in the sixties. And this photo is a very famous, you know, Avalon ballroom poster or the matrix. So I forget which one is the matrix the or the matrix. Avalon. Right. For and, the matrix. Yeah. I always loved this photo and I, and actually didn't know for years that you had taken it until I probably looked at the, the poster and saw your name on the bottom. Um, and that, and that's how your relationship started with Janice and you became friends with Janice Shoplin, right? Right. And then I said, let's do some more uh, photography of you guys. So I took them to a, a farm, a ranch in Woodacre, and I shot these silly little photographs of them. I think they're silly. But they're, they've been in museums and shows and, uh, and books. And uh, that's the nice one of her with her hair blowing and a big smile on her face. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of my favorites. A lot of people buy that one. But the, do you see the one with uh, her leaning up against the wall? Yeah, with the man next to her, right? Okay. So the story with that is, is that we were friends uh, in the hate. And then we moved to New Mexico 
And uh, she came later with Albert Grossman to do a cigar commercial. And she, I met her at the La Fonda in Taos and she grabbed me and hugged me and said, Lisa, Lisa, you gotta help me. And I said, well, what would you need? And she said, I'm tired of these city men. I want me a mountain man. And I said, oh, you got to come to my house up to Truchas and I will find you. I, in fact, I know a perfect mountain man for you. Okay. So if you come up there, I'll introduce you. She comes up, but she didn't let me know in advance. And I was grocery shopping and she came into the house with Tom and Albert Grossman brought her in. And she saw this guy on his haunches uh, smoking a camel cigarette and he had a beard and he was wearing a leather jacket. And, and she said, this must be the guy. I think this is the guy. And he says, hey, you want to go have a drink down at the bar? And church says a bar. She goes, yeah, let's go. So they go down and they're having a drink. And he says, you know, I got a potato bacon in the oven up at my uh, my cabin. You want to come up there? We got to check it out. Check, see how the, it's baking. <laughs> and, that's uh, like, that's going to be the, great, the greatest pickup line ever for John <laughs> Stoplin. You want to come see my baked potato cooking in my cabin. <laughs> <laughs> and so they go up there and we don't hear from them all night. And Albert Grossman's pacing the floor back and forth going, I got to cancel the air flight and everything. Where is she? Right. And they made love all night long. So in the morning, he brings her down in his truck, drops her off at the end of the driveway, and she walks up. Look what she's wearing. She's wearing sandals and a, and a paisley dress and a, a, with a fur top, and she's wearing um, a feather boa in her hair. And look at the smile on her face. She got her mountain man, and she made love all night, and she was a happy camper. So she sat down up against the wall of my house. You could look, there's marijuana growing in the window there. And that's Tommy Masters. Well, Tommy Masters would just happen to be there. And uh, he sat down and started talking to her. And uh, then Albert took him and left. Well, the next day, which is an important part of the story, he's sitting in the outhouse, taking a dump, looking at the Truchas Peaks and the Sangre de Cristos. And Jane Fonda walked by in front of the outhouse and he literally shit i mean it was a moment when jane came to visit us just during the anti-vietnam issues and uh there he got a double whammy in two days nice. that, that was just before she died ah terrible yeah, great, but great story great story the mountain man and janice and the baked potato that's the, i don't know if you can get better than that so of course this is in new mexico but there were still lots of things going on the hate um that was a little flash forward uh there's a band called the ace of cups that you photographed um uh tell me a little bit about who the ace of cups were and why you were photographing them well it's an all-girl uh band and uh they were it was something new and uh, so they asked me uh denise hoffman asked me to come shoot it. And she's a really good friend of Wavy Gravy's. And uh, in fact, she helped uh, produce uh, Basic Human Needs, which I put on Facebook all the time, him mm -hmm. singing the best mm -hmm. song in the world. And so I did a shoot for them. But nice. tell them about what they're doing now. Yeah, so it's funny because I actually met Denise Kaufman at a Wavy Gravy Save a Benefit at the Sweetwater in Mill Valley. And we were just sitting, you know, we're in the backstage green room and Wavy's there, you know, holding court. And we just started up a conversation and uh, we became friends. And because uh, Denise Coffin's easy to become friends with, right? She's this incredible person. So a lot of people don't know that she's actually Mary Microgram uh, in the electric Kool-Aid acid tests, right? So she's on the, on the bus with the Mary Pranksters with George Walker and Ken Kesey and Ken Babs and all those people. And, uh, uh, they the, the ladies are kind of spread out and live all over the place. Denise lives in Hawaii. And, and uh, you know, the Ace of Cups never really <coughs> made it, so to speak, in the 60s. They opened for Jimi Hendrix in the Panhandle in Golden Gate Park right after Monterey Pop. But they went off and had kids and raised families. And Denise went off on the bus with the pranksters. And they did all this other stuff. And they got back together a few years ago and put out their, their record that they made 50 years ago. And now they have a new record coming out. I think it comes out in about a month. And I shot that record for them. So we have something in common there. I did the most recent band photos of the Ace of Cups for their new record. And you shot them back in 67 here. Um, so, uh, you know, we're kind of uh, 
we're on that same wavelength. You know, I always talked about how I loved wanting to photograph all these cultural icons of the 60s. You're older than I am. You were living with these people. They were your best friends. And I came into it because I dropped acid as a young kid, suburban New Jersey um, teenager in the 1970s and, and fell in love with everything having to do with, you know, the Kesey and Leary and Owsley and the poster artists and the dead and the airplane. And, and I've been spending my life photographing these people as well. So I'm happy to have photographed uh, Denise and, and the Ace of Cups. And so everybody can look for their new record, but back to our regularly scheduled Lisa Law program. Um, so here's this photo that uh, of the woman breastfeeding her child. Um, to me, this reminds me of like the Farm Administration photos from the, the, the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl that like Dorothea Lang photographed. I mean, it has that same vibe. Yeah, Robin and her husband, David, lived up in uh, Pyramid Lake. And we went up and put a uh, teepee up up there and stayed with them, visited with them. And, and I said, I got to I'm going to give birth naturally to this baby I'm pregnant with. Uh, where should I go? And she said, well, I gave birth to the, the, the bigger one in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Why don't you go there? There's a natural childbirth center. So we decided we were going to go in our VW bus and with the teepee poles on the top and everything and drive to uh, New Mexico to deliver Pilar. Hi, Pilar. She's watching the show. Hi, Pilar. You're so great. My Pilar helps me a lot with my business. She works with me. She's your oldest daughter. Yeah, she, She's going to take over everything when I'm gone. <laughs> we That's all have to go. Many, many years. we got many more years of you. I hope so. So I left, we left there and we went down to the fantasy fair and the fantasy fair. Uh, those, that's those girls with the flowers in their hair. Do you see them? Uh-huh. They're up on the screen. Yeah. And we, our job was to put up our teepee always for a trip tent. I made that teepee myself on a big sewing machine. Can you believe that? I made my first teepee. So Tom Rounds and uh, Mel Lawrence of KFRC did the fantasy fair at Magic Mountain Music Festival, June of 1967. And it was the first known rock festival. So first this was, a, so, so just from a historical perspective, this is basically a week before the Monterey Pop Festival happens. And uh, this is up on Mount Tam in Mill Valley. And they really didn't do any music up there for decades until just a few years ago, a guy named Michael Nash, who lives in Mill Valley, started doing a, a, a show up there called the Sound Summit, which is a benefit for the theater and the mountain. And, and uh, they had incredible shows, I think, four years in a row. And actually, it would have been last weekend if it weren't for the old Rona 20 virus that has taken us all by, 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 um, by the neck. But anyway, so this, these shots here are the very, very first music festival really to ever happen. Uh, major rock festival. There had been jazz festivals before this, but this is the first big rock festival. Yeah, now we're going down to the Haight Ashbury. So well, Tom and I, I, I hang on. I got a few more pictures from up on the mountain here. I got uh, yeah. this this artist up on stage and some of the crowd. And now you're back in the Haight with this color photo of this this hippie guy just hanging out in the Haight, right? Right. This has been used by uh, various uh, universities as, as a shot from the '60s. Uh, they like it. <laughs> well, it's great. I love it. I mean, look at what she's wearing and the hat and the guitar. Yeah. And so this is 1967 in the Haight-Ashbury. And this pic next picture is people just walking down Haight Street in 67. Had, did you start just shooting color about now? Had you not shot much color leading up to this? I shoot color, uh, color off and on whenever I feel like it. And so I was shooting, but I was only shooting with one camera. Frank had given the, me the... Uh, Pentax, Honeywell Pentax camera, and then I bought a Nikon F. And a lot of these shots are done with the Nikon F. It's, right. it's what a good camera with the yeah. stable lens, no zoom lenses. That's what was a secret. Right. Yeah, that's stable. why everything's so sharp. Did you have a did you have a handheld light meter or was there a light meter in the uh, Nikon F? I don't think there was. It was it was a light meter in the Nikon F. So that was one of the first cameras then that started having a light, a light meter in there. I was right, very so so um, I got this shot here of Emmett Grogan, who was one of the uh, founders of the Diggers. And there's Richard Brodigan over on the right, the, the famous Haight-Ashbury author. Um, this is Paul Krasner, I guess, in the Panhandle or something. Um, 
Uh, yeah, so, during an event. There was so, a lot of events in the panhandle. They were, uh, they were feeding people. The diggers were feeding people a lot. And uh, a lot of events happened because it was right next to Haight Street. You just walked down two blocks and there was the panhandle. Right. So you had the, the grease, the grass and the trees. And that's, that's also um, guided them behind them. Kim is a picture of Jay who did the. Uh, Jay Phelan. Uh, you can't see his face. He's blocked by the, the kid to the right of Krasner. He was the guy who owned the psychedelic shop. Right. So this, this next photo, I just love this headline on the San Francisco Examiner 2000 riot in San Francisco rock and roll dance. I'm just driving down the street and I'm in the car and Tom's driving and I go, oh my God, look at that picture. It's a Look at that headline. It's perfect. It's right. and, and of course, but look at the, the headline below it about the Vietnam War. You know, it's just such a timely. It's amazing how a photograph like this that's so innocuous in some ways says so much about what's going on at that time in our in our history. You know, um, this very straight businessman, the rock and roll headline, the Vietnam headline. It really, to me, a photo like this just says so much and it's so well composed, it's exposed properly. I mean, it's really just a, 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 a really a moment in time that is just so important. And then here's a, looks like a big uh, event happening in the Panhandle. This looks like it's taken right about Ashbury Street, just looking right down on the Panhandle. Um, obviously some sort of free concert going on. Um, and then yeah, we get to- uh, That's been used in a lot of books because it really tells what was going on with the music and the whole scene and the Haight-Ashbury. Yeah, which was just, I mean, and I love, you know, again, you know, the cars tell the story of, they, they date stamp it, right? You look at the BW buses and BW bugs, look yeah. at all those buses. Right, and they're beautiful. And so like, you know, this is either a movie set or the real deal, you know, and it's the real deal. This is really 1967. Um, love, love, love this photo. Um, and then, of course, here is Jim Marshall, our old pal, the photographer. Uh, I did a lot of shows with uh, Jim Marshall and Baron Woman and um, Herbie Green. Else. And every time I saw Jim Marshall with his cameras, and I mean, Jim Marshall was a photographer. He wasn't a hippie. He was a photographer and he was just dripping with cameras. And so every time I'd see him, I'd shoot him. They had Woodstock and they hate Ashbury. I would shoot him with all his cameras. So yeah, I, have a I, lot I count I count four cameras on his body right there. There's a, two that you can see. You can see two lenses sort of sneaking out on his other side there. Yeah. So he's got at least four Leica. cameras. Get Leicas. That's a Leica. Yeah, the Leica. That's a Leica there. It looks like his Nikon in his hand. He shot mostly with Leica. The other lenses are definitely like also, but I think he had one Nikon that maybe had a longer zoom lens. But I think uh, his wider lens stuff was always Leica. Um, Mark Burnt, he he shoots with Leicas a lot too. Who? Mark Burnt, very fantastic. Uh, and then here's Henry Diltz, and Henry Diltz was like the LA version of Jim Marshall, except for um, not as intense and didn't pull guns on you and threaten your life. And, and and he he was the one who was asked to shoot Woodstock by Michael Lang. Yep. And he flew up there and shot the whole thing. And, and Baron shot it too, but Baron wasn't the photographer. Right, Henry, Henry and Jim kind of were. And so is that where you met Henry for the first time? Was that Woodstock? No, I don't think so. You'd already known him. So yeah, of course, and, and, and Henry, I have not asked Henry yet, but I hope to have Henry as a guest on the show, Photos with Stories. Um, and also just going back to the Ace of Cups from a little bit ago, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have Denise Kaufman on this show and we're going to call it stories with photos as opposed to photos with stories. Yes. That's a, fantastic. She's not, a, she's not a photographer, but she's got a great story and we've got a lot of memorabilia. Got a great and, story. And, and I know you'll loan me some of your photos for the program with her and, and because you have other photos besides those band shots. And uh, so anyway, so, um, but I hope to have Henry on the show because, you know, he was the guy in Laurel Canyon and he shot Joni and he shot the birds and the mamas. And he Papa. shot everything, but he was a member of a band first. Yeah, the, 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 the modern folk, the modern modern folk, and and so he he came from that perspective of being a musician. Um, but yeah, Henry's a brilliant photographer, and of course he has the Martian Hotel Gallery where you sell your photographs, and I also sell my photographs at the Martian Hotel Gallery as well. Um, so if you're looking for some beautiful art to hang on your walls, you can go to the Martian Hotel Gallery. You can go to Lisa's website, 
um, you know, and uh, you can fill those bare walls with amazing artwork of uh, pop culture history. Um, here's another show, I believe, in the in the in the Panhandle or in Golden Gate Park with a bunch of hippies on this top of this bus. They're then, watching. Oh, oh, that's the human being, right? Okay, so what was first, Fantasy yeah. Fair, and then Monterey Pop, and then the Human Being, or was it the Human Being and then Fantasy Fair and then Monterey yeah, Pop? Yes, so it was Human. Yeah, we went a little out of order. It was the Human Being first, and then the uh, Fantasy Fair, then Monterey Pop. Oh, yes. So we, uh, we we should have put the Human Being first. Just that out just yeah, now. Didn't I, we? Yeah, Human you Being told was. Me that that the uh, Monterey Pop was right after Fantasy Fair. If that's the truth, then this was. First, yeah, because uh, human being was in, human being was January of sixty seven. Uh, Fantasy Fair and Monterey Pop were in. Ju I mean, I'm sorry, human being was in January of sixty seven, and uh, Monterey Pop and Fantasy Fair were June of sixty seven. So, uh, okay, now look at the picture with that all the kids hanging out on that truck, mm -hmm. and go go to the front of the truck and see the guy with the V neck sweater. Mm -hmm. That's Ned Pearson, who was the. Um, he was the head of uh, the the of our school. Was it what do you call him? The, uh, the head guy, principal, a dean. Was it a college? No, no he was the kid. He, he was what a kid when the kid is the the head. Oh, the president of the student body. Student body. There you go. He was a president of the study body student body of Galileo High School. That's Ned Pearson right there watching that. To me, nice. that's interesting because he was a good friend of mine. Nice. Okay, now we're going to go to this uh, is the Human the, Being. The Grateful Dead with Jerry Garcia and Pigpen, and there's Phil Lesh and Bob Weir on the right side of the flag. And, that used uh, to be the cover of my book because yep. it was the Grateful Dead. Yep. Yeah. And you know who was standing right next to me shooting was uh, Dennis Hopper. Ah, who yeah. we'll talk about later. We similar Dennis, pictures. Yeah. Dennis and you were very, very good friends. And so, yeah, so uh, then we got Alan Ginsberg and uh, Timothy Leary. Yep. Michael, Michael McClure was there. And then now Your that's of, Gin, Ginsberg dancing to the Grateful Dead. Yeah. Love now that, that became. Uh, he just got up and started dancing because it made him crazy. He loved it. So this became his favorite photo, and it was in his album. He did an album, and he used it. He didn't even know who had shot it. And later, he when he was traveling around New Mexico, he stayed at my house with Gregory Corso, and and uh, Ram Dass came over for dinner. And But this is down below is the, when Michael McClure and Gary – Gary. Yeah, this Gary. is Gary Snyder, Michael McClure, Snyder, uh, uh, Lior Michael McClure. Kandel, Lenore Kandel, and, and Ginsburg is, I think, who's, who we're looking at here. Yeah, that's a famous, famous shot. Yeah. So, you know, I, the first time I ever photographed Allen Ginsberg, uh, actually, it wasn't the first, it was the second time, but the first time I was one on one, I was doing a portrait of him in my studio for a magazine story. And we happened to be doing the shoot on Yom Kippur, which is the, you know, high holiday, you know, high holy Jewish holiday where you're supposed to fast and repent for your sins and, and not work and, you know, just relax at home. And I said to Alan, I said, you know, he's Jewish, I'm Jewish. And I said, hey, Alan, you know, today is Yom Kippur and we really shouldn't be working. And he looked at me. And uh, he mumbled a, a Buddhist a Buddhist chant, a Buddhist prayer, and he goes, "Don't worry, we were all good now in a Buddhist kind of Jewish way." So he kind of <laughs> absolved us from our sins of working on Yom Kippur uh, when I was doing. It. And then after I did the shoot, while he was waiting for his car service to pick him up out front of my studio in San Francisco, he took his camera out and did a couple portraits of me. So somewhere deep in the uh, Allen Ginsberg photo archives, there's a couple portraits of me that he shot of me. So, all right, let's see here. Uh, now we're back at another TP with a bunch of boxes, which I believe is Monterey Pop. So this is Monterey Pop in 1967, and that is your TP. And what was your role at Monterey Pop, and what were in those boxes? We were uh, invited to set up the TP because it was a trip tent. Where we went, it was a trip tent. And uh, we worked with uh, John and, and the gang, and it was Alan Pariser's idea to have – uh, Monterey Pop uh, originally. And um, then John of the Mamas and the Papas took it over. 
And Alan Prezer was there too, but they invited us and we worked with the, uh, oh, this is an interesting story. We worked with the chief of police and I, and we said to, we had a meeting with them and we said, you know, uh, a lot of people are going to be taking acid and smoking dope. And so you have your choice. You can either arrest them all and take them all to jail or leave them alone and see what happens. You're actually going to be okay. And there were, two arrests, and those were rednecks that were picking on the hippies. Other than that, they didn't arrest anybody. Everybody was on acid, smoking dope, and it was great. So that's an example, just like Woodstock was, that if you leave people alone to do what they're going to do and enjoy themselves, even though they're smoking dope or taking acid, you don't have to jump on them and attack them and, and, and arrest them. You just don't. That's what we did at Woodstock. So that Excuse me. Those boxes next to, if you look closely, those are the posters for Monterey Pop. Well, here they are being sold right next to our teepee. And I never got one until Mel Lawrence gave me one later. But I could have taken like three or four. They're worth $1,000 or $2,000 a piece now. <laughs> but, this opportunity. But um, you know, uh, and then oh. here's uh, Albert Grossman, of course, Bob Dylan's manager and, and Janice's manager at Monterey Pop and Ravi Shankar, uh, Tiny Tim, uh, which you have a long relationship with Tiny Tim that goes into the hog farm, which I think we're going to learn about later. Uh, there's a great clip on your movie flashing on the 60s or documentary where Tiny Tim is singing at the hog farm in New Mexico in, in the late 60s, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, and he came to the castle. He was a very good friend of ours. And then he became very popular. <laughs> right. Well, you know, tiptoe through the tulips, right? Yeah. Yeah, he was really great. But uh, And of course, we you got know who came into that teepee? Um, uh, it was um, Jimi Hendrix came in with his boombox and he was playing it really loud. And we, we were sitting there kind of being chilled with Dennis Hopper who had taken Michael McClure had given him way too much acid and Dennis Hopper was in there and I said to Jimmy I said do you think you could turn that down just a little bit and he goes no problem no problem <laughs> and I didn't even know who he was at that point but right. Dennis Hopper spent half the day in there yeah, there's a great picture of um, of uh, Dennis Hopper at Monterey Pop that Jim Marshall took. It's him and Nico and maybe Brian Jones and, and Dennis Hopper's got his cameras around his neck, but he does look really fucking high in that picture. So um, now I completely understand. And I believe that um, from what I understand, Dennis Hopper uh, uh, kind of took his character in Apocalypse Now from the Jim Marshall, you know, with all the cameras around all his neck. Cameras dripping all over. Yeah. So, and then of course we got Mickey Dolans from the Monkees and, you know, Henry Diltz was the Monkees photographer down in LA during the whole period when they were together and making their television show. Um, uh, so another thing that, that, that Henry did, and then we get to the, 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 the big mega rainbow with the double teepees. And, uh, I think this brings us over to, uh, the end of your time in the Bay area and you moving to New Mexico. Is that correct? So from Monterey Pop, we drove uh, with Victor and uh, Tom and a bunch of us. We were with a group called the Juke Savages, and we had our own musical group. And we moved to New Mexico, and we set up camp on Cerro Gordo in my teepee. But then we took the teepee, actually, before we put it up permanently, and went up to New Buffalo Commune. And there were a lot of... Uh, communes being started up there and so we decided to help this group out and uh, I saw that picture I just thought it was great and then the next picture is Tom Law helping with the um, making the adobe bricks and I started documenting of course everything that was going on during that time and they, they use my pictures for a lot of books and shows and they show them in the main room still now because the building still exists. But the next teepee shot is the teepee I built and we set it up and we are helping them out. And uh, and this is at the new Buffalo co uh, commune that you set the teepees up. Yeah. It's a new Buffalo commune. Right. Yeah. And there, and there's in your film, your documentary, there's an interview with the guy about buying the land and starting the new. Rick Buffalo Klein. Commune. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and it uh, only lasted a year uh, because they just didn't make enough money to support themselves and growing their own food. And they, they needed to uh, get out and uh, get to work. And they just, it just wasn't happening. A lot of communes didn't make it. A hog farm commune made it. But this commune, it stayed there and it's been used for various things, but it didn't make it uh, Easy Rider. They wanted to use it for one of the scenes of the communes in, in the Easy Rider. And they asked Rick Klein, um, can we shoot here? And he says, well, no, we don't want the publicity. And, uh, and uh, he says, well, I will go cater it for you. And he says, no, we just eat brown rice and vegetables. We don't want the publicity. And he blew them off. And they could have done that shot, shot there. They should have offered him money. Ended up doing that part of the movie, Easy Rider, in uh, Santa, Santa Monica Hills. Oh, really? So it was all made up there. When they're supposedly in New Mexico in that scene. I know the scene you're talking about. And they have all these hippie actors that sort of have the glazed over look. And they're, they're, and uh, Peter Fonda and, and, and uh, Hopper are kind of walking around and picking up the dirt. And they're throwing the seeds down and everything. It's a, it's a, it's a classic scene. Peter says it's not going to work. He says it's not going to make it. Yeah. This was uh, a bunch of us hippies. Uh, and Barry McGuire, he's in that one too, uh, at, uh, with his wife uh, at the, the uh, springs up in Jemez, Jemez Springs. And we used to hike up there. We had to drive up and then hike down the river and up to the hot springs and uh, bathe like this. It was just wonderful. And this is a picture of Tom and me when I was pregnant. I'd be pregnant with Pilar, huh? I'm that pregnant. And that I'm wearing my wee peel from Wautla. And that and the next one is Barry McGuire and Patty. And McGuire. Barry's the guy standing in the back. And for those of you guys who know, Barry McGuire is the, the guy who wrote that song, uh, The Eve of Destruction, correct? Yes. You know, I don't know if he wrote the song, but he but sang the song. He sang it and it became a, a, became a, a an AM, FM <laughs> radio <laughs> hit. Minstrels that did it. He probably still he probably still makes money from that song to this day. He does. He's touring. He's become a born, born again Christian. And uh, hi, Barry. You might be watching. And because uh, he's still with us, and uh, he uh, he's traveling around still singing those songs that he was singing back in the sixties. He's still making it. This um, next picture is of uh, Paul and Laura Foster getting married at the summer solstice in Aspen Meadows in 1968. When we brought the hog farm out in their buses, we made a movie called Skadoo in LA with Otto Preminger and, and all of them made enough money in order to fix up their buses and get out of LA. So we drove to the Aspen Meadows and set up um, the teepee and the, uh, the geodesic dome and we had this big wedding uh, for them. And then the hog farm bought some land up in Yano. And hi, Wavy. Wavy and, and Ja. You, they and, and how did you meet Wavy and Ja originally to even invite the hog farm to come to? Because you're the one who, you guys, you and Tom are the ones who invited the hog farm to come to New Mexico, correct? And found them the land or or at least got them to New Mexico. Like, they how found you, the land. How did you already Wavy. know? How did you already know he Wavy? He was a member of the Phantom Cabaret. He was, uh, they were, had a phantom cabaret with Tiny Tim and um, Severn Darden. And it was in LA. And when we were at the castle, we would go to the phantom cabaret. And there was Wavy, who was Hugh Romney then, who was a comedian. And we got to know him because he, he was coming in from New York. And Tiny Tim was there and a couple of others and Severn Darden. And th that's when Severn Darden came over and rented a room at the castle. And so we, when Wavy, who was, uh, who was uh, Hugh Romney then, moved up to this mountain to slop these hogs, he became the hog farm. His group became the hog farm. And so we were friends and we'd go there every Saturday for their events that they had. And um, so when it was time to do this movie with starring John Philip Law, Skidoo, uh, they needed hippies. And, and we said, we know where we can get all the hippies you want. And we hired the, the entire hog farm. And I did the beads 
for the movie. And I, ah, this is interesting. In the movie, I'm breastfeeding Pilar on a couch. And it's the first time that breastfeeding was shown in a movie. Mm. Me breastfeeding Pilar. I hope, that, I hope that Pilar also got paid to be in the film and not just you. <laughs> she got plenty of milk, huh, Pilar? All right, there you go. All right, so so here's your bus. This is your famous bus, and I believe that's the Roadhog behind you. Is that correct? Right. Um, this is when we traveled around New Mexico in our buses, putting on shows for in Los Alamos, Truchas, the um, the rodeo grounds in um, Santa Fe. That bus is still in my backyard, and we'll see a picture of it in a minute. And the next picture of me is at the road at the rodeo with the, all the buses or uh, in my hippie hippie clothes that I made. I made a lot of clothes back in the 60s. So how, how old do you think you are in this photograph here? About 25, something like that. This is like 1960, 68, right? Uh, it had to be uh, after Solar, I think. So, all right, 68, 68. Uh, interesting. Love this photograph. Look at you. You're the most, <laughs> gorgeous, the most gorgeous, beautiful hippie chick then and now. Uh, okay. And then, so, and then of course, here's, this is the road hog with a bunch of, the, uh, these are hog farmers on the bus here. Hog farmers and friends, but on the front, it's all hog farmers. Yeah. And this was during the 4th of July parade in El Rito, New Mexico in 1968. And, um, Behind it is another bus, and behind that was our bus, too. Right. I love and on we, the door. Look on the door here. You see the little hog farm logo that Rick Griffin made for you guys. I never noticed that on this photo before, that little spray can or whatever. Oh, yeah, was. yeah. Right? So this, book, this picture has been used in a lot of history books, album covers, you name it, books all over, because it depicts the 60s, what the 60s, the joy of the 60s, the psychedelic part of the 60s, the bus. So this picture has been used a lot in uh, various places. It's one of my, that and the Bob Dylan are one of my two famous pictures that I have. This used to be the, it is a cover of, of my book now. It's, uh, that's this one here. See, there it is. Mm -hmm. Dropping off the edge of the page. That's my... Uh, Love it. So, all right. So this, this next picture confuses me a little bit. So basically you and Tom and at this point, Pilar and, and maybe another one of your kids is born and you guys are basically hippies living on the land in New Mexico. And all of a sudden you're in fucking New York city with Andy Warhol. Like, no, I'm not 68. So we go from uh, Santa Fe to uh, New York for the opening of hair and um, Michael, Michael, what's his last name? I'm going to die for not knowing this. He, he was a producer for hair. So he invited us to his house in um, Woodstock. No. Michael. What? Wa 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 Michael. The, 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 he was the producer of, of hair. God, I don't anyway, know. He lived in Chicago in a beautiful mansion and we all showed up and ate with their china and their, their crystal. And I think all their, their uh, people who worked for them quit that day because we were living in hippie buses in the backyard. <laughs> so um, we, we then went on to New York and we visited Andy Warhol at the factory uh, factory. So these pictures are taken of Andy Warhol at his factory, and that's his eye. And then we have Gerard Malanga. So this is so for the eye. I want to go to the eye shot. I love how sharp this is. I mean, look at the skin, the eyelashes. I love this photograph. Did you just did you ask Andy, hey, can I get a picture of your eye? I was doing everybody's eye that was there. Got it. You were just being a weird hippie. Eye. You were everybody, just people's eye, everybody's eye. You were just being a weird hippie with a camera and we're like, I want to take a picture of your eye. Yeah, this became a famous picture, this picture of Andy. Love it. Yeah, I have one collector who said, that's your most famous picture. And then the Gerard Malanga, he was part of his group. He was right. wonderful. Look at his leather pants. He's yeah. so crazy. All these people with 
Andy Warhol, Warhol were crazy, wonderful people. I just love how like you, you know, the hippies come to New York City and they're like, you're with Andy Warhol. Like it's just to me, it's just it's mind boggling. You know, like, you, well, know, we yeah, you were around Lou Reed and things like that. But then you're like out in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico, like with. Yeah, Holland. but he had just been at the castle, remember? Right. No, I know. Andy Warhol of the underground. Yeah. No, yeah. I, so uh, we knew him. And I so knew there was that connection, but it's just, to me, it's just, you know, like I, like I said at the beginning, when I introduced you, you were this, you were in the right place at the right time over and over again. I was you know? lucky. Yeah. Uh, all way. right. And here is the famous further bus. Um, and this is part of a famous story. Uh, is this part of the, the road, the road, road races, the bus races? Is that what this is from? Well, you saw it in the movie, the great bus race. Great bus race. Yeah. Okay, so we were all at Aspen Meadows in 69 now. We'd already done 68. Now we're at the summer solstice in 69. And um, we had a great bus race. At the same time, go to the picture below it. So that's Yogi Bhajan. We invited Yogi Bhajan to come to teach yoga that day. And during the great bus race, Thank God these guys went out there during that time because they would have, they would have run over them, right? But he was teaching yoga, and there was they were in a tent at that point. But it was we had this great bus race with all the buses, and this is Ken Kesey on top of further coming down. But he lost the race to the hog farm, the hog farm bus, the road hog. Okay, he lost the race. But that was during the great bus race, which is famous. And then uh, after Yogi Bhajan taught this class, we started, Tom and I started the ashram out on West Alameda at a friend's land out there. And uh, then he eventually built his entire ashram in Española. And that's why you see Sikhs all over New Mexico is because he started the yoga classes and then they did the uh, Zeke. Uh, so let's, let's move, let's move, let's move on. Sikh karma, which is studying Sikh, the Sikh religion. Nice. Let's move on to this photograph of wavy gravy, which I believe is in an airport, but, but there's a whole backstory about why you guys are even in this airport and where you're going and who invited you. So, so this is really the beginning of the Woodstock adventure. Well, if you at, at at the summer solstice celebration in '69 at Aps, Aspen Meadows, Stan Goldstein, who was one of the producers of Woodstock, came out to ask us to come to Woodstock to help with security, to help with feeding the people, to help take care of the people that were on acid, uh, because we were such a big group and we worked so well together with Wavy, who is still Hugh Romney. He wasn't wavy gravy yet. That happened after Woodstock. Uh, we were a group that he knew could help out on the grounds and do everything that needed to happen on the grounds. So he hired us to come out there at that point at the summer solstice celebration. He'd already mentioned it to Wavy in New York, but Wavy thought he was kidding. And he said, no, I want you to come out. So we all went out in, uh, we, we uh, took trucks and buses and cars to the airport in Albuquerque and they flew in a jumbo jet from American Airlines and we all got on that um, plane along with the teepee poles and uh, a lot of people took acid before they got on that plane. <laughs> So this is a picture of getting off the plane in New York. And as you could see, there's lights on him because there was cameras rolling. There was the press was there to greet uh, the hog wavy graveyard you know, and, the, and the hog farm. And uh, they said, we're her, here, your head of security. And he says, oh, they've made us the cops. And they said, what are you going to uh, use for... Um, what are you going to use to do to um, control the people? Yeah, control the people. So, security, what are you going to use? He goes, lemon pie 
and seltzer bottles. <laughs> and, and he says, so you're going to be the head of security with that. And he says, well, do you feel secure? And, he's, and the guy said, yes. And he said, well, it must be working. So, you know, he's a comedian. So he always had a, co a comedian I, answer to a comedy answer. Hey, to everything. Uh, Lisa, just to clear up some business, my pal Dan Skinner just texted me that Michael Butler was the producer. Of, there you go, Michael so, Butler. So we want to give Michael Butler a shout out. Thanks, Dan Skinny Man. Michael, for uh, you know, Michael Butler's still alive. Right. So this next photo here. Um, is a pretty important photo at Woodstock. There's nothing about this photo that says Woodstock. You would never know it's at Woodstock, but it's a really important photograph at Woodstock. T tell me about this particular photograph. This is the, the last part of my black and white. I only was shooting with one camera and this was the last picture I took of Tom putting up the medical teepee at Woodstock with one of Yasker's cow uh, cows watching him. This picture has become very famous. I think it's a very pretty picture. You know, it's just in a show in uh, in uh, Nebraska. But it's also famous because it's really the beginning of the infrastructure being built for yeah, what it's Tom Law putting up the hippie with his long hair putting up uh, hi Tom, if you're watching, putting up the first medical teepee on the area where the hog farm was going to feed everybody. And right. right over the edge of that cliff is the free stage, surrounded by all the buses. And this next picture is... In the uh, kitchen. I helped design the kitchen and the food booths for feeding. And then I went to town. So tell me, well, tell me about John Morris. Who was John Morris? And what did you say to John in order to actually get the kitchen built? Well, uh, we, uh, we had already designed the kitchen and the food feeders, the booths, and they were being built by the hog farmers. That was some of the things they did because they're very creative. And, um, we had a meeting and we were talking about what, well, what should we uh, do about the food? And, oh, we'll scavenge some uh, stuff down at the free store down there. And we'll get a little of this and a little rice and a little that. And I said, excuse me. <coughs> I said, um, I think, you know, there's a lot more people here already. And that's a week away. I, I think we should get more more than just a little bit and more tools and pots and pans and stuff. So I'm going to go into ask John Morris, who was one of the major producers and I call him the voice of Woodstock because he was the one on the stage always and with the microphone saying, get down off of those towers and oh, it's going to rain. That was John Morris, the voice of Woodstock. So I went into his trailer and I said, listen, if you want these people to survive, and be happy, you're going to have to feed them. So why don't you give me $3,000 and I'll uh, go in and town. Give me a truck and I'll take Peter White Rabbit and we'll go in and get some food and supplies and tools and pots and pans. And, stuff. and he said, okay. He gave me 3000 We got in the truck. We drove in and went to Greenblatt's and bought 1,200 pounds of boga weed, 1,200 pounds of rolled oats, dried apricots, um, Wheat germ, almonds, uh, honey, soy sauce kegs, and sunflower seeds. And we then ran out of money. So I went into the office downtown New York and I said, Are you guys, uh, John and Joel, I really need uh, some more money if we're going to cook all this food. And I need another 3000 So they called John Morris and John Morris would give it to her. And I bought, I mean, Dan, Peter, and I went and bought pots and pads, all stainless steel because we knew that aluminum was dangerous for you. So it was everything, except in that picture, that's a hog, a hog farm uh, bowl, uh, mixing bowl. But I bought all stainless steel. And I bought 130,000 paper plates, 130,000. Dixie cups, 130,000 spoons and forks. And um, I also got a green jade Buddha that we put in the kitchen to protect 
the kitchen. And um, then we put it all in the truck and Peter and I were driving back and I ended up driving back because Peter got too tired and I was picking up all sorts of hitchhikers on the way. Do you know that they really promoted this all over the United States and that's why all those people showed up. It wasn't just local, they promoted it everywhere. And people were coming from everywhere to go to Woodstock. And so I'm chewing on some ginseng, driving and doing the breath of fire out the window <laughs> to get us to back to Bethel where the concert was. And we unloaded and we started, the kitchens were ready, the food, the food booths were getting ready and we started cooking. Oh, I got onion cutters and cleavers. The cleavers were just in the New York Times uh, during the anniversary. A picture of the cleavers. I still have the pot and the cleavers. I keep everything because I want to do the museum of the sixters. I'm a, a real pack rat. You're a hoarder, huh? No, I'm not a hoarder. <laughs> I'm not a hoarder. Now I, I, I can't wait to see, I can't wait to see what's in that storage locker and it ends up in your museum. All right. Yeah. So, so anyway, so so that and brings we us fed two hundred thousand people is what happened. Right. How many? Didn't you and you know that number because why? because of the amount of paper plates and Dixie cups that we bought because we were ser serving out of the Dixie cups as well as serving on the plates. So it's 130,000 Dixie cups and 130,000 plates. And they were all gone at the end. And we also got the plates from the other concessions because uh, they ran out of food and they gave us our plates, gave us their plates. So all that, all the rolled oats and the sesame seeds or sunflower seeds. So you basically were making granola, except for you didn't cook it. So what do you call it? M mus it was muesli, but Wavy Gravy called it granola. And then everybody said I was the granola queen because I had created granola because there was no granola at that point. But I didn't cook it. So I called it muesli. But he called it granola. Right. And that's when Wavy actually in the movie says, what I have for, uh, in mind is breakfast, breakfast in bed for 400,000. And, and really, it was, you know, like a lot of people think that he was talking about the next band that was going to come on. And that was breakfast. But really, you guys were handing out tens of thousands of cups of granola slash muesli um, to and the I people. Right. Oh, right. by the way, when I got back from New York City and we were getting stuff going in the in the kitchen I took a flatbed truck and I went to a farm really close by and I said give me that row that row that row and that row of corn and tomatoes and cucumbers and and zucchini and and I asked and I bought their almost their entire farm of food that they were growing and brought it back in the flatbed truck to the kitchen and they started chopping it up and putting it into the bulgur wheat. So we had lots of really good, healthy bulgur wheat for lunch and for dinner. And the lines were pretty long. Tom La, La who, who was teaching yoga off the stage, you could see it in the movie, in his movie, in the Woodstock movie, he invites everybody. And I did too. I got up and invited everybody to come over and get in line and that they, the line they trickled in and pretty soon the line where the lines were really long because people were hungry they hadn't brought any food right so let's let's flip through some of these photos so really you didn't shoot any of the bands so here's a big crowd shot just kind of at the beginning of the festival here's i think one of your food lines um that's going along uh just you know people hanging out over by where your whole camp was set up over line. Um, then there's uh, a milk line and a water line. Right. And then the teepees, this is, are these your teepees over by the hot These farm? are the teepees we brought to put up for the medical tents. Yeah. Right. And then uh, there's, of course, the, the stage. And it looks like this is, this is still early on because the-, the early on. Before the festival even started. And weren't there like 50,000 people already inside the festival by the time they were ready to open the doors? Yeah. They said, uh, uh, go collect the money. They asked us to go collect the money from those 50,000 people. And uh, Hugh and Tom and a bunch of guys got together and they had a little powwow. And then they said, do you want a good movie or a bad movie? Because at that point, 
if you try to collect money from people that are sitting out there already, it's not going to work. Right. And uh, Warner Brothers was already there shooting like crazy. They knew what they had and they were, they were sleeping under trucks and everything to get these shots. I mean, they made a beautiful movie. And, uh, and so. Um, so that's when it became a free concert at that they, moment. They, they never got the, they never got the gates up. They never got the fences really up. They didn't. It was either finish the stage or finish the fences because they had to move from a different location. And they were in Wallkill and then they right. Wallkill kicked them out and they'd already built part of the stage. They had to move everything over. Oh yeah. We all know that story. So I, I love, I love, I love, this photo, I love this shot of Hugh wavy gravy with the floppy hat. Hugh, yeah. He's know. about to go on stage there. Right. With this, he's got his megaphone because he can reach all 500,000 people with this little megaphone. I mean, when I was growing up in New Jersey, wavy was just such a cultural icon for me. I'd read about him. I knew who he was. I remember seeing him for the first time ever, um, you know, collecting money for something in Central Park. I think it was the summer of 1979. I was with a, a, a girlfriend of mine walking through the park. And I'm like, there's Wavy Gravy. And I didn't have a camera. And the first time I actually photographed Wavy was at the Rainbow Gathering in 1982 in Idaho. He had a big, giant, giant top hat that he was, again, collecting money for. And now you shoot him all the time. And now we're like, you know, I love when Wavy calls me on the phone. I'm sure he does the same thing to you when he calls you. He says, hey, you've got gravy in your ear. You know, it's the, it's the, it's always the greatest phone call when Wavy calls you because it's just you know he's just such a a genuine icon and 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 dear friend and I mean I know you guys have been friends for for going on fifty yeah, plus a, years he's, now. He's a saint. Yes, and there's is. a movie about him called Saint Misbehaving. Yes, there is. It's an incredible documentary, and uh, <laughs> if you've not have not seen it, I highly recommend. Uh, uh, it was directed by Michelle Ezrick, another wonderful he's female film, filmmaker. And she just she just directed that new film about Tracy Morgan um, that is on Netflix, so you can check that out. Uh, here we are back at the kitchen. Uh, with That's all the first kitchen. That was the kitchen that the the pranksters set up, and the early hog farmers set up before we got there because they had to feed each other. Right. So they set up a kitchen. That little girl down below in the little white dress down there—that's Pilar. All so right. that was the first kitchen where they were serving. You see, they're aluminum pots. Mine are all stainless steel. I better, and I better, I better interview Pilar and hear all this from her side of the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then I got to go up in uh, helicopters. I would go up to the helicopters and I'd say, "I'm with the hog farm, and I'd like to go up." And they'd take me right up. Right. So I got to shoot a lot of stuff from the air. Love the big crowd shots. And then what's this little race with all these little kids and there's uh, Wavy in the, in the middle before there? Before it started when we, you know, they were, we were there like over a week getting ready. So this is a, the children's baby race. They call uh, it the baby race. And Joan Baez came over and she played at your little free stage yeah. in the hog farm. But, but you see wait, uh, Hugh Romney in a diaper yeah, right in the yeah back here. Yep, that's what I'm saying. Wavy in the middle. He's emceeing. It looks like he's got a microphone in his hand, so he's emceeing the kids' race. Yeah, he was practicing for getting up on stage in front of five hundred thousand people and or four hundred thousand and 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 telling everybody there were a million that. on their way. You know, that never probably made it. They uh, couldn't make it. There was the traffic was horrible. Right. People this were they were parked along the side of the road and get out of the car just walk. This is backstage, Joan Baez. Right, right. But this is another, the next one after that is the aerial shot. And I think that those three, three tents right along, if you follow the trees that are in the middle, right behind it, behind that green and white striped tent, are those the food lines right there? Yes. The, the second one, you could see, see it better. There's actually one, two, three, four, five booths, but two of them don't have tops. The tops uh, okay. Oh, okay. I see. I see them on either side, right? Yeah. And so, you so could be said 10 lines. There's five booths, but it's 10 lines. Right. So I guess this, is, gotta be, this has got to be early on because there's only a couple hundred people milling about. So this is probably, you know, at the very beginning or, of the festival. There was, yeah, there's still grass. It's amazing that you have these aerial photographs. It's just incredible. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. I don't know why. I just thought it was important information I should get. Right. It. And then, of course, here's the helicopter delivering medical supplies and whatnot. Yeah, right. 
And then, mm-hmm. and then here's one of the few bands you shot on stage. Quill. I think that this band is the band Quill. Quill, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's um, the only time I got up on the stage. You could see Michael Margetts with the camera on the left. Uh huh. One of the Warner Brothers photographers, and uh, Quill has used this and the video I did of them for their work. They're doing they're, they're I think they've got a documentary that maybe one of the daughters is working on. Yeah, right. And then uh, here's Albert Grossman walking the band. There's Robbie Robertson in the back, Richard Emanuel on the right, um, Danko in front of him. Uh, no, Danko's in the hat. I'm sorry, Danko's in the black hat. Uh, but this is, I guess, them in the raincoats getting walking towards the stage or uh, off the stage, something like that. There's a ramp that went from the backstage over to the stage and they're right. walking under the ramp. And right. I was on the ramp and I looked down and I said, whoa, the band, wow. And then, of I course, here's the aerial that. photograph that you got of the it whole crowd. It's a crowd. famous aerial photograph. They showed it at the anniversary. They blew it up really big at the anniversary because it really shows what's going on. Look at the grass right around the stage. Right. They didn't allow people. They wanted that for helicopters to land, but the helicopters, some landed there to to bring in the groups, all the groups had to be brought in by helicopter. We right. couldn't put them on the road. At, and I'm pretty um, sure right at that intersection, on the on the over on the left hand side where that single tree is, um, before the stage, I think that's the intersection where the monument is today. Yes. <clears throat> right? Yeah. And then there's a forest on the right, and to the right of the forest is the hog farm area. Right. Yeah. So that's how you get out from the hog farm area and then around. <clears throat> right age and we've met people right next when he said what we have in mind for is breakfast in bed for four hundred thousand is when we serve muesli in dixie cups off the stage right uh, off to the right of the stage we drove up to where it's green there and then we uh no to the right of that we had to drive in there and then we were just handing dixie cups of food and and serving people right into there I mean, it, it looks like there's no security. It looks like you can walk from the hog farm forest area just right into backstage down that road. And it doesn't look like there's a lot of people that are. Oh, well, there's a, a fence there. <clears throat> right. All right. Let's keep moving on here. So because we're 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 at an hour and a half and we still got a l- lot more ground to cover. Oh, so God. so yeah. um, uh, uh, here I'm we are at the hog farm afterwards. Are <laughs> Right, so this is back at the hog farm, and here's John Sebastian. At the Symposium, uh, where we had an event to show uh, concert makers how producers, how to have a concert doesn't rip off the people. And then then John came to that. And right, here's, and here, here's Wavy Gravy. Wavy, and then here's Tom Law on the tractor. Now we moved up to our farm, and we started growing our own food, and that's my daughter, my husband. Uh, and Truchus, that's a Truchus Peaks behind there. And the next one is Kids in the Corn, one of my famous shots of the kids. The corn children, corn. Of, children of the Corn. Yeah, well, it's, no, Kids in the Corn. <laughs> yeah, Loving Children of the Corn. And then the, the peace that's sign it. and the peace flag and, and the snow. Tom and me, uh, pregnant. I guess I'm pregnant. And that's to Solar and Pilar and our dog, Icarus. Now, we're, uh, then we start visiting Dennis Hopper, and he was doing the last movie. He'd already done the Easy Rider and Taos, and that's now, was he Was Dennis living in New Mexico when he made he the last movie? He was living right there at the, at the ranch there, yeah. Right, and, uh, and, and uh, so, De- so you and Dennis had already been friends. You already knew each other. But and this- I became his photographer. Right. Every time I saw him, I would photograph him. So he would always pose for me wherever he was. Oh, there's Lisa. Hi, Lisa. And he'd pose for me and we'd hang out and have dinner and do stuff. He'd come to the farm. And this is Alejandro Hodorowski, who did El Topo. And he visited when he was editing the last movie. Mm-hmm. And he told Dennis what he should do to make the movie work. They changed it. It was workable. He left and Dennis put it back and it never showed. <laughs> it was a shame. This is Robert Redford. He's directing Milagro Beanfield War up in Truchis. I photographed that. Here's uh, Dennis, uh, Peter Fonda, the hired hand. I, I was the only one who shot him being shot in the hired hand. And uh, I was his masseuse during that time and did some cooking for him on the set. And there's Wavy. I did a lot of photographs of Wavy. Some of his greatest ones, I think, is adorable, wonderful person. And at, this is a Seva concert. 
with Jackson Brown and uh, Wavy and Graham. Graham Nash and Kate Wolf mm -hmm. uh, at a SEVA concert. And right after that, um, that's when I asked Stevie Wonder to be at Peace Sunday. And uh, that was the night I asked him and he said, yes, I helped Graham Nash and Graham and I have been friends ever since. Right, but this, is, a, this is Odetta first. We have Odetta here. Yeah, she was at the SEVA concert. Everybody always right. played. And then this is this is you and Graham and Wavy somewhere. Oh, this is at the this is at the opening, the release a Pacific Arts release of my movie, uh, Flashing on the '60s. Right, and Graham. then of course you reconnected with Alan again years Alan later. Alan Ginsberg, I was doing portraits of him, and this is uh, Floyd Red Crow Westerman, who is very active uh, um, in the in the AIM movement and. Um, uh, he, uh, Bill, uh, Bill, uh, Bill Wapapa, also another Bill famous. Bill Wapapa another. worked for 20 years developing agencies for helping the Indians, and he was a member of AIM and the Treaty Council. And Floyd Western, they're about to do a movie about him, and he's just Floyd, absolutely... It was, he was incredible, yeah. Yeah, and he was in uh, Kevin Costner's Dancing with Wolves. This is John Trudell, one of the most important uh, lyricists during our time. Uh, he died recently, uh, and uh, the, uh, see, the FBI burnt down his house in Oregon and killed his wife and two kids and mother-in-law because he was so politically uh, against right. what they wanted. And that. <laughs> oh, God. There's so many things in history. There's Dennis when he was uh, editing the, the last movie, and a picture of Dennis before... Uh, uh, that and uh, these are some of the pictures I shot of Dennis. This is of him in a painting at his house in uh, Reggie's house. He loved that painting. And then I took a picture of him holding a gun that he gave me. This is at my house here. He gave me this gun. I said, "Hold it, so I could prove there was your gun." And this <laughs> has been in various museum shows, and it's been on the cover of magazines. This was at uh, the Bill Graham Memorial with Jackson Brown, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. This is the first picture I ever took of Graham Nash uh, at Rudy Records. And here he is when I was shooting him for Hemp Times. Uh, I had him on the cover of Hemp Times. Here he is in concert with Crosby, Stills and Nash. Jackson Brown behind his gallery, uh, behind his studio when I was shooting uh, John Trudell for him. And he turned, uh, he was driving away, he turned around and looked me straight in the eyes. And that's one of my favorite pictures of him. This yeah, was I love that mirror shot. It's such a great yeah. shot. I have to rush through this now. And there's Peter, <clears throat> Pete Seeger. Pete Seeger, the most important person during the, all the beginning of, of uh, folk music. Pete Seeger and Absolutely. the activist is incredible. And, and I got to know him a little bit, shoot him, and that's Peter Yarl or Peter, Paul, and Mary. Uh, John Nichols, who wrote um, a Milagro Beanfield War uh, and another 35 other books, too. And there's, uh, um, who is that guy? Jerry Garcia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know who it is. It's Jerry Garcia here in Santa Fe. He played yeah, that's here. About, 80, about 84, I believe. John Morris put on those concerts, The Voice of Woodstock. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then here's uh, Timothy Leary when I was shooting him for my movie, Flashing on the 60s. You mean Ram Dass. This is Ram Dass. Excuse me, Ram Dass. And this is the cover of his other book. It's called Still Here. And then we have uh, Peter Rowan. I did three album covers for him. Wonderful. Hi, Peter. And uh, Bonnie Raitt and Jimmy Cliff, Chris Christopherson, the um, Beach Boys. And this I is a great them. shot because, you know, this is rare because it's in, you know, fairly recent times. I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, but it's got Brian Wilson and Al Jardine with Mike Love. And, and so, you know, this yeah, is that, that one that, time that, they got back. That was at the Woodstock uh, Museum. Okay, got it. Very cool. This is Roger Daltrey when I shot him for Hemp Times. John Lee Hooker, that was in uh, San Francisco. Um, Richie Havens, that was in Telluride. Ramblin' Jack Elliott, wonderful friend of mine, still alive today. 
And then we have, um, what's the Carlos. next? Carlos. Right. And uh, Carlos. Uh, okay. Then we have. Um, Michael Shreve. Yeah. Carlos yeah. Tana. And then he, Michael Shreve became famous at the Wood, original Woodstock concert when he did that long drum. Right. Is that when you met, uh, is that when you met him for the first time, Shreve at Woodstock? Yeah. And then he came and lived with me afterwards at churches for two weeks. Cause he needed to get off of drugs. <laughs> you mean right after Woodstock or at another? Yeah, right after Woodstock, he came with Got Carl Tana and, and here we are, Stevie Ray Vaughan. We, uh, so this is the Stevie Wonder shot that you were talking about a little bit ago. And so Stevie Wonder, I, 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 this, I mean, these, these two photos of Stevie are in some small little club or restaurant or something. What's Downstairs from the La Fonda Hotel, he was uh, mixing the Aquarian album. And this is about 1972, 71, 72? I'm not sure. But, but, but this, is when, but this is when you this is when you asked him to do the Peace Sunday show, correct? He did Peace Sunday. So Peace Sunday, uh, Taj Mahal. Hi, Taj. Taj is watching. Love you. Taj was there, uh, and Jesse Ed Davis. That's that's who he's. That's who Taj is with American right now. Guitarist uh -huh. that played with Taj a lot, and then. This is various pictures I took at Taj and Taj when I had him for the hemp magazine. And I shot, you know, I shot Taj's last record with Keb Mo. I shot the cover of that. And then I shot a cover of just Taj by himself about it. Yes, you did. Yeah, yeah, you did shot. And this is the, uh, my hippie bus in the parades here. I went in a lot of first places here. So this is your original bus that you that brought. Psychedelic, psychedelic. This bus is circa night. I mean, this is the same bus you were driving around in with the hog farm in 68. Yes, it's a 46 Chevy flatbed that was made into a home by an artist in Taos. And then Tom and I bought it for $150 and 67 and drove it around. And then when I started doing shows on the 60s, I took it and painted it. And you're going to see it next to my house now. Uh, that's what it looks like right now next to my house. And this is the inside of it. Okay, so Amazing. that's a psychedelic bus. Where did you? Where did? Where did your four children sleep inside this bus? We only had two during that time. <laughs> so did did Pilar get special treatment because she was older? She got more space. <laughs> Not really. And then we go to this Mex this museum project you had going on in Mexico. So tell me what the story is with this. We have time for all this. Uh, uh, because I'm down there in, in uh, Yalapa, in Puerto Vallarta, it was the 100th anniversary of Puerto Vallarta, I gave them all these pictures, and, and Mark, Burton and I did these panels. And when Yalapa saw that, they realized they should really build the museum. They should go ahead. We've been trying to get it going, but they decided Tatiana Rodriguez, um, and Fernando Garcia got together with me and we built the museum in five months. Below is the next picture of the, of the opening of the museum. Uh, not this March, but the March before, we, after we built the museum, there's 250 people, locals there. Then you see us cutting the ribbon at the opening, the president standing there, the big guy there. And, uh, and below is the opening day with hundreds of people seeing all my photographs. I have a hundred and photographs in there and I was a curator of all the items in these tables. And that's my office. And that's what it looks like. It's absolutely gorgeous and it's still running today. We just had the anniversary. And this is a mural of uh, Filippo Legrand, uh, who is the muralist of Yalapa, who did this mural and Hi, Filippo. If you happen to see this, Filippo is six. He has five tumors of the brain and cancer of the lungs. And we're honoring him and trying to take care of him, get him back to health right now. And the next picture is all of my children, all of them, and my all of my grandchildren. <laughs> Hi, all you guys. Congratulations. Jesse, Pilar, Pilar. So, so um, 
And of course, we have uh, uh, her website, flashyonthe60s.com. And I have my website up here, Rock Out Books, if you want to learn about some of my books that I've done. So, Lisa, what's next for you? Well, I'm going down to uh, work on the museum a little bit more because I have to curate more. Then I'm going to Peru to uh, meet with my grandchildren and my gra daughter Sunday and uh, ride horses. I'm buying a horse down there for her, helping. And uh, hi, you guys. And then I want to get a house here in Santa Fe. I need some endowment for it. For it. I already have a nonprofit. I want to do the Museum of the 60s here. I've given it up because it's a lot of work. But now because I have two sheds in the back here filled with memorabilia and pictures and everything, I think it should be out in public. It should, I should get a house and, and put all this stuff in it. I mean, wouldn't the, wouldn't the, the city of, run it. Wouldn't the city of Santa Fe want a tourist attraction like that in Santa Fe? I mean, don't you think that they would help help put some money up because I mean, it would it would it would help your economy. It would help the, the city. They won't help me. The city won't help me. And Museo Cultural wants it, and they won't help Museo Cultural because we were going to build an extension onto Museo Cultural. I already had a show there for seven months. I brought in uh, eight thousand people, and I did a and they curated from that and did a show at the History Museum that went on for uh, I think it was ten months. And it was so popular. So I just need somebody like Tatiana Rodriguez to say, I'll do it. And we'll do it. And we'll put the stuff in it. And there it'll be. And Pilar will run it. Right. I, just, I mean, it, says, it's need, we need to do that. Yeah, it? it'll be it'll be great in a house. I mean, the Allman Brothers Museum in Macon, Georgia is in a house. It's called the Big House. It's where the band lived. I think that I think it'd be fascinating. I think it's important. I think that all of this pop culture history that you have documented You've been a filmmaker, you've been a photographer, you're a mother, a farmer, an innovator. I mean, all of this stuff, you know, like I said, you're at the right place at the right time with a camera and you knew how to use it. And, and uh, you know, there's so much history that you've documented. And to me, you know, that's why I became a photographer, because, you know, at first I wanted to document what was going on in my life, which was going to a concert where I lived. I was 16 years old. I photographed the Grateful Dead, whatever it was, you know, and as time went on and I started to you know, develop my own ideas and what I wanted to shoot and the people that were important to me, you know, like I wanted to shoot pictures of Ken Kesey and I wanted to shoot pictures of Wavy Gravy and I wanted to shoot pictures of the Grateful Dead. And, uh, and that's my next book that I'm working on. I'm working on a book on psychedelic icons and, uh, you know, the story behind these people like Denise Kaufman and, 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 you know, and, and Owsley and Leary and Ram Dass and, and people like that. But these people, and the things that you were doing with the hog farm and in Santa Fe were so groundbreaking and innovative. And if you really think about it, you know, the things that you guys were doing, you know, back to the land and, and, and uh, organic farming and recycling and, uh, um, you know, all of those things, which, which people, I don't know if they laughed at them or they thought, we, you know, you hippies were crazy, are just part of our our normal everyday lives now. And the people that have tapped into it realize that. Yes, if you eat a healthier diet, you will live longer. You know, if you don't put chemicals in your food, it's better for you. And the food tastes better. Um, you know, all of these things that people just thought were so out of left field 50 years ago are just, you know, so important to our planet today. And, 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 it's, and, it, and it was ground zero, you know, in the Haight-Ashbury, the communes of the late 60s and the 70s and all the things that you and the hog farm and of course the hog farm still exists and you know wavy gravy still has camp winter rainbow and uh uh you know there's just you know and of course there was going to be the first big you know there was a hog farm music festival scheduled for this past uh this past summer um and then of course is canceled because of the you know coronavirus and you know covid19 so again you know, you were at the right place at the right time. Let's see if there's any questions out there. Harrison, anybody send in any questions for Lisa? I want to say something, though. That John Paul DeGioia backed this movie. Without his help of, of being the executive producer, I couldn't have made it. And he put in $300,000 into this movie. And when people give me money to do things, I do them. Good things come from it. Yeah, and, and, and if, if somebody wants to help with do the museum, we will do the museum. It's not that we won't do it. We're yeah, no, do you it. get things done for sure. And is, is that person, John, 
John Paul is he is that John Paul Mitchell the hair? He is John Paul DeJoria who owns Paul Mitchell Products. Right. He he made Paul Mitchell happen. He was the one who who sold it and got it going. And got then it. he Patron Tequila, and then he sold that. Got but it. He's a, he's a great entrepreneur, and he is a great person. He he has love, peace, and happiness. Uh, he, he helps all sorts of groups all over the world. All well, the hopefully, time. He'll, hopefully he'll help you in some fashion with the museum, the Museum of the 60s. Um, Harrison, the voice of God in the background. Do we have any questions for Lisa? Definitely. So the first question is from Allison, and Allison wants to know, across your entire career, who has been your favorite person or event to photograph? Famous event or person to photograph? Your favorite. Favorite. Well, I, I think Bob Dylan. So Bob what are your, some of your uh, favorite memories of working with Bob Dylan? That question is from Jimmy. Um, I was kind of scared when I was shooting Bob Dylan, but I, recently I've seen there's thousands of pictures of Bob Dylan out there. So I wasn't the only person shooting him. So I think he was used to being shot. So when I'm sitting there at the dining room table and I'm shooting him, he was okay with it. I think he made a face once or twice, but he let me do it. Even though I was intimidated by who he was, uh, he let me do it. But uh, he's, to me, he's the most important lyricist and songwriter today, still. And I just turned my grandson on to him uh, and we played No Direction Home, which is a great movie about his life. And I think he, he's a gifted person that, that we should all, all you young people out there should get to know Bob Dylan and his work. Absolutely. And Woodstock would, would be the, you know, even though I didn't take any fantastic pictures of Woodstock other than Tom putting up the teepee, that event was very, very important. And I've shot a lot of other things like that too. I mean, I've taken aid to El Salvador. I help with the Navajos uh, getting with Bonnie Raitt and Jackson Brown and, and uh, John Trudell getting money to give them more sheep and to st stop the, help stop the relocation. I've done so many different uh, shoots like that, that there's, and also in Peru, when they were flooding in Peru and people were losing their beds and they're going down the river, I would go to their village. I said, what do you need? We need beds. And I'd go online and get money. Eloise DeJoria gave me $5,000. I bought 120 beds, 240 blankets, and, and uh, got you? these people back in their beds. And, and, and I shot everything. So at, and A to El Salvador, uh, uh, Pastors for Peace. In 1999, I, I shot that. We and we made a movie, and, and a year later, we were out of El Salvador. So I've shot many, many, many things that, to me, are all very important. And I wish I could show you all of them. I would like to show all of that because I have an office in the back here that's filled with hundreds of thousands of pictures and slides and and movies and. <laughs> did you, uh, uh, Lisa? Did you? Um... Uh, were you at those uh, protests with Wavy and Jackson where the anti-nuke protests where they got arrested and Jackson was playing guitar in jail? Were you part of those? No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't there during that time, no. Got it. All right. Harrison, got another question? Definitely. How did your experiences with Maria, Sabina, and the mushrooms impact your artistic eye? How did I do what for my artistic eye? How did it impact your artistic eye? Oh, Maria Sabina, um, just before I shot those pictures of Maria Sabina, I gave her a massage. And she had a tumor on, on a side of her stomach, which he, she died from that. But in the book, it says, not all foreigners are bad. Uh, someone gave me a massage and she noted me. And to be able to photograph a Mazatecan Indian for a cover of a book and more pictures inside, I was just blessed. And Sally Grossman flew us there in a small small airplane for me to be able to take that picture. So uh, to me, it was just a really great event for me to, to be, to, somebody chose me to do that. When people choose me to do uh, photographs for them, I am very honored because I think 
that I can capture who the person is. Did taking the mushrooms though inspire you or or propel your your creative eye in any way? That psychedelic experience with her and the mushrooms. I didn't take mushrooms with her. I took mushrooms with another uh, Corandero at that time. And did and did did, the, did those psychedelics or taking LSD inform your creativity at all? No, I think uh, I've been already taking LSD and before that. And I think LSD is very important for, for creativity. That's for sure. You have to be careful how you take it. You can't just take it. You got to prepare for it. You know, it can't be, uh, when I did a show up in, uh, in Canada, the kids would came up and said, how, how do you take uh, uh, LSD? And I said, well, first of all, you have to have a guide. You have to have a certain place. You can't just take it because it's not good for you. You're going to go on a trip and you're not going to know what's happening. And you need somebody to help you through that trip. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what we did at Woodstock is we help people through their trips. They're walking around with hundreds of thousands of people and they're going, Mom, where am I, Mom? You know, and we're saying, OK, come on, we're going to go into this little tent and you're going to. What's your name? My name is Bob. OK, Bob, you're going to be OK. I am. Yeah. Just calm down, Bob. You'll be just fine. And the next person who comes in looking like you with their toe in their mouth. That's what way he tells the story is that you're going to help them out. You know, so uh, I, there's a really great story about uh, when they asked us, uh, we had these red armbands with uh, flying pigs on it at Woodstock. And if you saw somebody wearing that, you could go to them and they'll help you. And so the, pro the producer said, how many uh, armbands would you like? So you could do that. And we said 250,000. Because if you get somebody else involved, who's then going to help and everybody's helping everybody. And that's what the Woodstock generation was, is everybody helping everybody else and being good to everybody else. The people on the stage saying that's your, that's your friend, that's your neighbor, John Baez saying that, John Morris saying that, that, that everybody took care of everybody else at Woodstock. And that's why it was peaceful. And all these riots and, and people that are being damaged because they're demonstrating don't need to happen. We don't need to get the police in there. And we did not have police at Woodstock and black lives matter. We do need to protect people who are demonstrating and we do have to stop all this killing that's going on. It's just horrible right now. And especially during the COVID when people are stuck in their houses and they get angry and then they get out of their houses and they, they act out and that's not good. So we need to calm down and everybody needs to help it, everybody else get through this. It's not easy. And of, and of course, we all need to make sure that we vote. We need to vote. And that is super important. So if you can't vote in person, get your absentee ballot and get it in the mail now. Do My not car wait. is covered with bumper stickers for Biden and Harris. They are, the whole car is covered with it. And yeah. people when I drive down the street go, yay, yay. And because, and I say, yes, we must vote. And there's some out there promoting voting. If we don't vote, we're going to have a really hard time for the next four years. We're we going to have a really hard time for the next four generations. Yes. Um, Harrison, you got another question? We got time for one or two more. Sure. At which point did you realize that Woodstock would become such a legendary event? And that question is from Michael R. Uh, when it was happening. Was there a specific moment at the festival that you realized? The thing is, is that there were no police and the, and the, um, the police that were there were there to help us and they were called the police force. When, when it was peaceful and we didn't have to take their money and it was free and we were feeding everybody and it was in the newspapers, it's a huge articles in the newspapers, papers were coming out. Uh, right then it was already famous for what it was. And I was so proud. Do you know how much got, we got paid to work there? Nothing. $75 a piece. <laughs> yeah. We should got a little part of the movie, don't you think? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Well, Wavy, then, has, Wavy had a speaking part in it. Yes, he had a speaking part. He should got a little more. But anyway, it was it was historical at that point, and I knew it was historical. And I was glad. After I got the kitchen going and Johanna Ra was taking over, I just took my movie camera and I went out and shot everything I could. My still camera, my movie camera, I shot everything I could because I knew it was going to be important. Harrison, got another question? Yeah. So aside from your upcoming trip to Peru, do you still travel and or photograph often? Yes. I just came from a vacation. I went to India to visit with my daughter, who's a, a um, homeopathic uh, doctor, and she's a midwife, and she runs a clinic in, um, in Brindavan, where Krishna is from. And we went on a vacation to Sri Lanka with my grandson Kunja and my granddaughter Ashraya. Hi, Ashraya. And we, uh, I documented every single Buddha I saw. Every single part of the trip was unbelievable. If you have no idea how many Buddhas are in Sri Lanka, you got to go. And I, I, I'm writing two books right now on my last two trips to uh, India. And I'm writing a story about the a book about the making of the museum in Yalapa. And uh, hi, Nenji. Hi, Tatiana. Did you, hi, do the, did, you, did you do the bus trip um, with Wavy and Larry Brilliant and all those people? And I think I was having babies. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It seems like about the time you were making babies. So. I was making babies like crazy. All right, everybody, I want to just thank Lisa Law for her time, her stories, her energy, her photographs, her films, her books, her documentaries. Um, you can find all of those things at her website, flashingonthe60s.com. Uh, support the arts, buy her books. She will sign them to you personally. Um, get, shoot her an email. You can find her email contact on her website. Um, she's offering a discount. Uh, don't forget my next photos with stories is going to be with Clayton call uh, Berkeley, California photographer on September 27th. And then after that sometime in October, we don't have the exact date yet. I'm going to do Denise Kaufman from the ACE of cups. And uh, we're going to talk to her about her adventures with Ken Kesey and the Mary pranksters and Lisa law and the hate Ashbury. with stories she's not a photographer um lisa your work is fascinating like i said i'm envious of all the incredible places that you've been um and involved with it for a long time uh just like my daughter ricky is also involved with photography so like you keep saying that your daughter pilar is going to take over everything for you my daughter is doing the same thing with me, let me tell I've, got you a lo thing. I've got longer to go than you hopefully let me tell you one thing if you feel that you might have a little sickness from the covid boil water put three drops Put a towel over your head and breathe that in, into your lungs, into here. And when it gets here, it will kill anything that's there. And the doctors aren't telling you this. And then have a, a ginger and turmeric and lemon tea that you drink warm all day long. Gargle with salt water once a day. But do that with the breathing. And I will tell you, you will have no symptoms after you do that kind of breathing. Get that mm -hmm. hot wet air into your lungs and take this for what it is because lisa is a hippie and the hippies know how to heal and that's right? from india it came in from india that that healing all right well there you go about. lisa yeah. thank you so much thank you everybody photos with stories thanks to the team will and, and and harrison for the questions thanks everybody for watching taj thank you for everything you've done thank for you, lisa and, and me i love photographing you thank taj you, so um, uh, we'll see you all again soon. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Uh, peace out from New York and Santa Fe for now. Uh, I'll be back in San Francisco in just a couple of days. All right. Cheers, everybody. Thanks. Adios.